how do, how do we respond? Should we respond? How we should respond? And I wanted to uh, just um, elaborate your points so that we have a good starting point for that discussion. So, Vinny, if you will take the floor. All right, well, let me just answer the question first. I'll give you my conclusion. Uh, the United States should not be involved in this at all because it doesn't have a clue about what's going on. And I don't think it has any understanding of the dynamics of the crisis that's occurring here. And just to pick up on what Ron uh, just said, ISIS is not powerful because it has weapons or money. ISIS has gained control because of the collapse of the Iraqi regime and the dysfunction of the Syrian regime. That dysfunction seems to be endemic in all the countries that we're talking about. I mean, if you look at Egypt, look at the, the, the hollowing out of the Arab Spring, uh, you look at the confidence of people in their governments, uh, there's a huge vacuum that's growing in this thing that we call the nation state. The caliphate is a genuine alternative to it. And so what we're really looking at is a, is a war that's being fought on two levels. On one level, you've got the states who are going to try to save themselves. We're going to define this problem as a problem of terrorism that needs to be repressed at all costs, and by using a lot of state power to do so. And then you've got the growth of the caliphate for people who are, generally speaking, dissatisfied with the nation state, with capitalism, <laughs> with the general state of affairs in the world, who want an alternative to the nation state. These are the young fighters that are going into Iraq and Syria right now. So I don't think that we're really going to see a collapse of the Islamic State. I think that what we're really witnessing is a morphing of the ideas of Al-Qaeda uh, into something that's genuinely more attractive to a large number of people in the world. Generally speaking, people who are disillusioned with the way the world is being run right now. Now, let me make a caveat about what I'm going to say. I, I reserve the right to revise everything I'm going to say tonight. I mean, I spent the whole weekend making an argument that there was no way Obama was going to be able to put a coalition together. And at 10 o'clock last night, turn on the news, and there's a coalition, OK? I still think the coalition is flawed. Um, but obviously, I have to restate my hypothesis that the coalition's not going to work. So I had to come up with a completely different way of thinking about what's going on here. Um, and so what I did is I said, OK, we've got this problem. And we've got you know, some fairly you know, mundane and time-worn ways of thinking about this particular problem. We've got you know, things like terrorism out there and you know, um, jihad and all this stuff that have been floating around for years and years and years. And they really haven't really gotten us very far in understanding what's going on here. I mean, what we seem to be is on a rewind button here, just repeating a lot of stuff that's been, been going on for a long time. And I said to myself, OK, we've got this president uh, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, and now he's bombed his seventh Muslim country. Uh, you know, starts out with Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Iraq, and now Syria. There's something wrong here. I mean, there's something wrong. And I say this as a strong partisan of Obama. I mean, I love the guy. But there's something wrong here. Something isn't working. So I said, all right, Vinny, break it down. Try to make sense of it. I mean, how, I mean, how do you take this, this situation and come up with some sort of coherent narrative? And I realized that if you start with the assumptions that President Obama and President Bush and a lot of state leaders are using to describe what's happening here, you're going to misunderstand an awful lot of what's going on. So I chose an alternative framework for thinking about um, the Islamic State. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out five ideas, and we can kick them around and, and see if any of them make sense. But the argument I'm going to make is that we've got to dismiss the American narrative of what's happening here. This is not a war on terrorism, except in a very attenuated sense, in which I'll talk about it at the very end. These are a series of simultaneous wars that are going on in pretty much the same place. Um, and you know, the first war that we're looking at is a regional war. That's been going on between Saudi Arabia and Iran for some time. 
And this war, this regional war, was precipitated by the invasion of Iraq in March of 2003 and the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, fundamentally changing the balance of power in the Middle East. And all of a sudden, the fears of the Saudi Arabians in terms of the expansion of, of Iranian power, fear capsulized, encapsulated by um, Jordan's president, Hussein, talking about the Shia president, became really inflamed. And so we, what we have is a real intense competition that's going on here between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And I think that's where you start thinking about what's going on here. Now, the second war that's going on is a subtext of the regional war. <coughs> it's a sectarian war. That it, we in the West talk about it as Sunni versus Shia. It's a big mistake because it's, it's not a religious war. We talk about Shia and Sunni because that's the way the Saudis want us to talk about it. Because the Saudis are worried about losing Arab support. And so what the Saudis want to do is they want to, to link um, certain problems um, associated with groups like Hezbollah and Hamas and identify them not as an Arab problem or an Arab-Israeli problem or a Palestinian problem, but rather as a Shia problem. Okay, and so what, what, what we see is a, a real attempt to inflame this religious divide, and this is very obvious in Iraq, uh, to inflame this religious divide in order to disguise uh, the shifting uh, terrain between Saudi Arabia and Iraq. And the Saudis have been quite adept at doing this. Now the third war that's going on is an internal religious war that the Saudis at one point really dominated. And that is, who has the soul of the fundamentalist religious movement here? Who has the soul of political Islam? And you know, the Saudis have always believed that the Wahhabist tradition in Saudi Arabia gave them a claim to this tradition, that they were the leaders. But they made a real Faustian bargain. Because while they wanted to press Wahhabism, um, they were afraid of it because Wahhabism doesn't sit comfortably with the monarchy in Saudi Arabia. So the Saudis essentially said to the Wahhabists, okay, we're going to buy you off. We're going to make sure that you can operate abroad. And you can cause all sorts of trouble abroad. And you can go to Afghanistan. And you, you can inflame uh, the madrasas in Pakistan. You can do all this stuff. But you're not going to do it in Saudi Arabia. Well, it's come home to bite them, because right now we see an internal Wahhabist war. And there are four groups. You've got the Saudi Wahhabists, who made their position very clear. You've got the Qatari Wahhabists, which are a completely different ilk, but very, very much opposed to certain of the aspirations of Saudi Arabia. You've got the Al-Qaeda Wahhabists, the Al-Nusra group in Syria. And then you've got the Islamic State Wahhabists. And they're all trying to claim the mantle of political Islam. They're all trying to claim, ultimately, the right to found the caliphate. But only the Islamic State has had the courage to really talk in those terms. Osama bin Laden did in his fatwa of 1998, but he never really emphasized it. And Al-Qaeda never really emphasized it. But it was there. But the Islamic State says, no, we want to establish the caliphate. This is our aspiration. This is our political objective. And they're trying to seize the dynamism of political Islam in the world, not just in the Middle East. So that's the third war that's going on. The fourth war that's going on here is a really interesting one, because it's the Russian-American war. And it starts in Bosnia, uh, with the, the American support for the Bosnian Muslims, which then turns into support for Kosovar independence which the Russians took um, as a serious affront to Russian aspirations in Southeastern Europe. And then the Russians went tit for tat, went to Georgia, carved off South Ossetia and Abkhazia, and invaded Georgia. <coughs> and then now, I mean, with their problems in Chechnya, <coughs> they tried to counterbalance the American support uh, with diversions from American support um, for Ukraine. Now, Ukraine isn't really 
a Muslim issue at all in terms of the Russian-American competition. But the thread from Kosovo to Chechnya to Georgia to Ukraine and then ultimately to Syria all has to do with the Russian calculation about its advantage vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And in four of those five issues, the Islamic issue is paramount. So that competition is going on, and we're going to see what the Russian response to the American strike in Syria is. Because the Russian claim to President Assad's allegiance and to access to the Mediterranean port in Syria, and a good, reliable buyer of Russian military equipment is on the line. And so we'll have to see if the Russians choose to escalate uh, the confrontation in Syria. Now, the fifth and final war that's going on here is the anti-terrorism war. And this is the war with all the familiar language. And the strange thing here is that the anti-terrorism war brings the role of the state back to the fore, the one I started out with. Because state power is what's going to be mobilized to address the terrorism threat. And whether it's state power in terms of an organized military, where the police force in Ferguson, Missouri, is being mobilized, and it's heavily militarized. Uh, and the terrorism argument is being used to accentuate state power at all costs. Now, what's interesting here is that all the states, the United States, the European Union states, uh, China, and Russia, all have the same interest. They want to snuff this out, but they don't know how to work together on this particular issue. The Russians have been really been flummoxed in terms of trying to deal with their own Islamic issue and while at the same time trying to be somewhat aloof and divorced from the American concerns about terrorism. What's going to happen, what, the really interesting thing and what we should all look for is how the Chinese decide they're going to look at this issue of terrorism. Yesterday, there were four Chinese nationals that were arrested in Indonesia. They were arrested because they had tried to uh, gain contact with a representative of the Islamic State in Indonesia because they wanted to go to the Islamic State to train because they supported the idea of the caliphate but also because they wanted to go back to their home which was in the Xinjiang province and they were Uyghurs and so the Chinese ultimately are going to make the same connection that there is something going on in this organization for the caliphate, which is emerging out of uh, this perception that the nation state, the economic system of the nation state, is failing, and we have to come up with a genuine alternative, is affecting people all over the world. Now, the reason why the United States should have nothing to do with this is because the United States doesn't understand any of this. And I don't think there are many governments who are willing to, or able, to negotiate or navigate so many simultaneous conflicts. Well, or intelligently. I wouldn't know how to do it. I have no idea how to do it. These are all cleavages that have to be addressed. But the underlying root of all of this is the stuff we've been witnessing for the last, you know, essentially 20 years, which is the erosion of belief in the liberal dream of democracy, of capitalism, and of human rights defined exclusively in terms of the individual. And people in the world are asking for a real alternative. The Islamic State is offering them one. It will be, a it will be successful as long as power collapses. It's not really a question of how powerful the Islamic State is. It's really a question of how weak the rest of the world is. I mean, look, this is our fourth war in Iraq in 23 years. I mean, and what do we have to show for it? Is there any reason to believe that military power is going to achieve any sort of a different result? Just give me one shred of a belief. Well, I'll take anything. Yeah. <laughs> um. 
I don't know whether to keep asking questions or to make some points. I, I think, I think. Well, I'm sure I pissed off a lot of people, so. 